Welcome, Mushko Patrick, your host for the town halls that you'll be viewing for the next two months. The town halls are presented by the 100 Black Men of Syracuse Incorporated as a result of the 100 Black Men of America's National Institutes of Health and Morehouse School of Medicine's Health and Wellness Grant. Two weeks ago, we presented the first series entitled Violence Prevention. If you missed it, you can find it on Facebook and YouTube. Today, the topic is Healthcare 2.0 and COVID-19. <laughs> COVID-19. Our distinguished presenters are Dr. Eric Griggs and Dr. Sharon Brangman. Please put your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll also welcome viewers on Facebook Live. Our first presenter is Dr. Eric Griggs, a New Orleans-based community medicine physician and health educator who has dedicated his professional life to raising health and wellness awareness in the communities across the country. Doc Griggs, that's his health and wellness persona, is the health and wellness committee chair for 100 Black Men of Metro New Orleans and serves on the 100 Black Men Global really Health and, we were, and Wellness uh, Committee. I was a little kid, my grandmother would have me go out and wash the car. If I turned that hose up real high, I couldn't wa water the, the flowers with the same pressure that I could the car because it would kill the flowers. What's the same thing is more water comes into the system of our bloodstream, the pressure goes up. And as a consequence, you damage the flowers of your kidneys, the flowers of your eyes, the flowers in our brains. Getting us to understand the whole point of healthcare 2.0 is for us, specifically us, to be experts on us. And nowhere, you know, we were talking before uh, we went on air, we went live uh, about how New Orleans is. Nowhere was it more evident in a city uh, that is 67%, 60 to 70% African-American and we're one of the hottest, the hottest, a hot spot for the entire world with COVID-19. And then in April, our governor came on and said that seven out of every 10 bodies that they found in the morgue that had died of COVID-19 looked like us. And the reason why was the underlying conditions, those things that we accept. I have five generations of diabet diabetics in my family, which is why I can talk about a little sugar. It was a whole lot of sugar in my family. <laughs> so much so that they would be comparing insulin bottles and talking about how many shots they would take all day. The people dying of strokes, our life expectancy is considerably shorter than our other counterparts of other races. Considerably shorter to the point that it's normalized. Well, I lived to 65, well, I made it past my daddy who died at 47. Uh, my mom had a stroke. This is not a true story. My, my mom, in case she's watching, I'm not talking about you. My mom had a stroke uh, when she was 47, but she's fine, so I'll be fine. Normalizing and educating ourselves and actually learning the language about how the mechanics of our bodies work and monitoring them better than we do our car. We have all the switches and the dials and the diagnostics for our cars, and we would ask more questions about how to keep that running and how to keep the oil running in our car before we would ask about ourselves when we go to that what 12 minutes. The average time for a doctor to see a patient prior to COVID-19 in person was 12 minutes. And that's 12 minutes from the time you're in the room to the time you're out. That leaves little time for questions and little time for full understanding. What, what's happened is, and it happened in our community, and that's part of the reason that we're here, is people forgot that in the sender message receiver equation, the most important part is the feedback loop, meaning time for the, the, the receiver to ask questions so the sender that's given the message can understand and make sure they're leaving on the same page. So that's the whole concept of Healthcare 2.0. It was no more evident than we would be at our national conferences. We were in Las Vegas. This happened in Las Vegas and it's happened at other conferences. We end up at, at, at Essence Fest, the same thing. We end up checking people's blood pressures as they come to the conference, our members, their family members, and inevitably every time we end up having to send someone to the hospital uh, for a myocardial infarction, uh, preeminent stroke. Uh, at Essence Fest, when they come down, I, I partnered with the state and the schools here, and we do blood pressure screenings with the students. We had a line of people lined up being taken to the hospital for emergent, emergent and urgent blood pressures, pre-stroke, 200 over 110. And oh, I'm on vacation, I feel fine. So people think the misconception that because we're on vacation, it's the summer that we're on vacation for our medication. And you know how we act when we go to our conferences. We have our balls, our presentations, uh, there's drinks, there's food. We wanna enjoy ourselves, but you can't enjoy yourself if you're not here anymore. And if you traumatize everyone um, by not taking care of yourself. 
Out of that was born Healthcare 2.0. The discussion happened, the launch happened almost simultaneously as COVID-19, uh, and it couldn't have been more perfect. It couldn't have been more timely. Uh, what Healthcare 2.0, what it encompasses is a, a, a realm of home and remote monitoring of blood pressure, of your pulse ox, of blood sugar, and, and even the things that other biometrics that you might not understand, but it creates a common language for everyone to discuss so we can fully understand them. So not only does it, it, does it, does it bring new technology to ours, to our lifestyles, but it brings a new dynamic, a new dialogue, and a new, a new, new realm of education and expertise on ourselves. We, your health is your wealth. Your health is your wealth. And it's no more relevant than, than right now because we now know that COVID-19 is exploiting all of our vulnerabilities. They call them comorbid conditions. So I live as a community medicine doctor. I don't see patients. Uh, I spend all my time now uh, doing this, educating, doing workshops, doing policies. Well, all my time now is I'm on TV, radio, town hall, talking about COVID-19 all the time, but explaining how it's relevant to someone's, it's not someone else's problem, it's our problem. I've lost 13 people to COVID-19. I have two that are in the ICU right now, and I have seven more from the ages of seven, I mean, ages of nine to 74 that are positive right now, that I'm worried about whether or not they'll be here. They took it as a joke. They took their healthcare as a joke. Uh, like I said, I tell people to get checked, get fit, get moving. And that's what Healthcare 2.0 is about. It's about knowing, being your expert on yourself, going to your doctor visits, doing your reading, doing your education, not being afraid to be the kid in the classroom because when it's you and your doctor, it's just you and her. And it, you're the only kid in the classroom. So there's no bad question. No, no, I don't understand. I'm here with you for my 12 minutes, but I need to live the rest of my life. Ask those hard questions. And then what we've created is a platform for you you, our family, and our community to come back to us with their questions that they don't understand. And we, the, the Health and Wellness Committee, will do our best to answer those questions and empower, give it back to you. And that's the whole thing with a sender message receiver equation. When you create that dialogue, it's not me as a healthcare expert. I learn from you as much as you learn from me. It's, it's not what I said, it's what you hear me say you heard me say, and what you can champion and go be me when I'm not there. That's what Healthcare 2.0 is about. It's making us the experts on us. And part of that is having frank and honest conversations about who we are, what we are, and what we're trying to be. And from there, I'll, I'll put the COVID veil back on and hand it over to Dr. Brady. Well, not yet. Not yet. So. <laughs> because a couple of questions for you, uh, Dr. Griggs. First of all, uh, what you said that you should ask your physician hard questions. What are the hard questions you should ask your physician? So the hard questions you should ask your physician is, you know, the, the thing is, traditionally, we go to the doctor and we try to not disappoint them. You have hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, you have syndrome X, diabetes mellitus type 2 uh, potential, and you might be, well, you might be pre-diabetic and everyone does exactly what you did. They do this. Do you understand? They say yes. No, the hard question is the question that you don't, I don't understand that word. Excuse me, no, do you understand? No, can you explain it to me? Explain it to me in, in the way, if you want to frame it right, explain it to me so I can explain it to my grandchild or I can explain mm -hmm. it to my child. Because if, if I can explain it to them, then I really know it. So those hard questions are the whys, the what, and not, don't speculate. The, the, the hardest thing to do, and I'm gonna tell you all y'all, the hardest thing to do, and don't disappoint me, is stay away from Dr. Google. I wish if I see him in the street, it's gonna be me and him. Dr. G-O-O-G-L-E, when you look up your symptoms, if you have a splinter in your finger, Dr. Google will show you all the symptoms and the last thing will be death. But the whole thing, but, but wait, Dr. Griggs, we might not be rushing to Dr. Google, but how do we keep Dr. Griggs in the room? Because Dr. Griggs is trying to get out that room before we can get those hard questions answered. And I know when I'm talking to my physician, I keep asking, and I know he's at the door standing there and I keep asking those questions. So how do you keep the doctor from rushing out of the room? So, so here's the thing, you have to understand that that doctor, in spite of the island that we went to med school, a lot of us back in the day, it was our practice, it was us, and it was a whole line. That doctor has a team. There's a team that you should be able to ask that nurse. You should be able to call back. You stay, you be a thorn in the doctors, that healthcare system side until they get your questions answered. And to be quite honest, listen, Doc Griggs one at Gmail. If you have problems, 
email me the questions. And if you need a doctor to call and speak doctor to doctor, I do it. I've gone, to, I actually go to the doctor with my patients prior to COVID-19. I don't see patients, but I'll go with them. I'll be your, I'll be Say your that email again. Doctor. Say that email again. Doc Griggs one, D-O-C-G-R-I-G-G-S, the number one at gmail.com. It, 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 you, it, you know how you always feel better when you have your big brother? Somebody punch you in the eye when you're a little kid, you go get your 13 year old brother, you feel better? Well, that's, that's who I am. Question, if we have Guillain-Barre syndrome in 1982, should you not take the vaccination? So if you've had Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a, 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 it's a neurologic syndrome, it's a nervous system a syndrome that they had possibly from a viral illness, uh, over from, it could have been from an injection. It's something that you talk to your healthcare provider about distinctly and you go through all the details of with them um, to make sure that it's safe. Now, from what we know of the vaccine, it's, it is safe unless you're allergic to any of the preservatives that are listed in it. And they make it, and I'm gonna tell you this, it sounds funny. They tell you, well, unless you're allergic to the stuff in the vaccine and we listed it on the website, man, I can't read all them big words. Nobody knows what that means. What does that really mean? The, the, the vaccine itself, and again, this is, this is not my, it is my, it's not my portion of the presentation, but you have mess, a little piece of genetic code wrapped in some fat and some protein. You go to the doctor and ask him, am I allergic to any of the, the fat or the protein uh, that, that that vaccine is wrapped in? And if there are any other preservatives in it, then let me know. If you've had a reaction to any, any, any injectable before is when you should talk about it. Even so, you can still be taken in a controlled environment and take it. So there's no reason to not take it. And Dr. Brayman will pick that up when it's her turn. Um, Jonathan wants to know, how do you best, you said stay away from Dr. Google, but uh, they want to know, uh, how do you best use WebMD, Mayo Clinic, et cetera, for your personal health needs? Because there is some good information on these websites. So how do you distinguish between Dr. Google, which you don't like, but WebMD, Mayo Clinic, et cetera, which you may like, depending upon what they say? So that, hold on one second, there's a siren. And just one second. And again, if you have a question, please use the Q&A. Uh, and, uh, and if you're on Facebook Live, we'll get your questions over here. Okay, go ahead, Doc. So I, 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 I really, really I enjoy the Mayo Clinic because, so here's the re reality, right? The average American reads at a fifth to a seventh grade level. Uh, and what you'll have to have a lot of times, it's not just in medicine. You'll have a lot of people trying to impress other people with these big words, these long descriptions that people don't understand. Mayo Clinic does an excellent job of putting things at a level where most the lay person that's not in healthcare can understand. The issue with WebMD in the past, and it's since improved, is that they, it was really fatalistic. I mean, you every time you would read it, you would think you had... <laughs> I mean, at one point I thought Everything. I was pregnant. I mean, it wasn't just, right, right, wasn't just right. my gut, you know? Um, but Mayo Clinic is a good place to start. My, when I say stay away from Dr. Google, only start there and then go to real people. Or the, and some of these websites actually have a chat function. Again, email me. If you don't have something you don't understand, then I'll gladly help. And I, I do put that out there and because I, I do this every day. Um, but yeah, start there and don't let that be the end. But may, I really, really enjoy the Mayo Clinic site. All right, um, thank you for that, Dr. Grizz. We've got a few more questions for you. Um, and this is related to, again, a lot of, depends on where you go, but you're also seeing other healthcare professionals, whether it's a nurse practitioner or a PA. Um, and how, how should we talk about those two healthcare professionals and, where, and how that fits into the medical mix? So there is a seat for every stethoscope. And there's a reason that they are there. Um, you know, my godmother was a nurse. My wife is a nurse. Nurses help make doctors. And uh, Dr. Brain will attest to it. When you're on call, my first night on call, and I had to do a cold blue on uh, my, the, the July 3rd, the nurse was telling me what to do. I freaked out. I'm like, what, somebody do something. Everyone's looking at you. The reason they're there, no one would be in front of you where they're not qualified to do so. And what I find is that the nurse practitioners, the nurse, the nurses, the, 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 they learn medicine from the person back to the science. And a lot of times, a lot of my colleagues learn from the science up to the person. And by learning from the science up to the person, you end up with those uncomfortable exchanges, like you said, like rushing out of the room as a sitting down, the empathy of, look, you know, you really don't understand that. So I think they're qualified. If there's a... 
and I think uh, Dr. Griggs has uh, frozen for a second. So what we'll do is come back to him for this question around, oh, there you go, Dr. Griggs. So we missed yeah. that answer around, uh, and I tried to frame it so it wasn't about qualifications, but if you had the concern that you're not seeing the doctor and you're seeing somebody else. Uh, and so you were answering in that and you froze a little bit. So can you just finish that yeah, up? So am I there? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so, so the thing is, the, the, the short answer is, it's a matter of comfort. Ask if that person can answer your questions to the point that you understand it. It could be an MD, PhD that has horrible people skills or might not understand the, the solution or the question that you feel that you feel totally unfulfilled as opposed to someone else that's not doesn't have all those qualifications. It could be a PA and uh, nurse practitioner. Yeah, so uh, we had a little, so, okay, so Dr. Griggs, we'll, uh, uh, again, can you just finish that last sentence and then we'll move on yeah. to Dr. Brangman. <laughs> I, I would say you should, you stay there until they make you feel comfortable with the answer and that you fully understand it. It doesn't take a lot, all those qualifications mean nothing if you don't have the relationship. This is still, it, it, it's an art and it's the art of mm -hmm. people in medicine. All right, Dr. Griggs, we thank you so much for your presentation. Dr. Griggs is going to stick around because uh, we have, uh, we'll have some more time after his, uh, after Dr. Sharon Brangman. Quickly, Dr. Griggs, can you just tell us uh, in one minute or less, 30 seconds or less, actually, your educational background? So my educational background, I uh, went to the University of Notre Dame undergrad, went to Tulane Med School, uh, finished in a transitional residency in family and community medicine in 1997. Then I'm currently the uh, in clinical trials, and now I'm the community medicine director at Access Health Louisiana, 47,000 patients in 36 clinics. Appreciate that. All right, thank you again, Dr. Gritz. Let me introduce our next distinguished presenter, Dr. Sharon Brangman, who's a graduate of Syracuse University. When we were in school at the same time, as a matter of fact, hey, she earned her medical let's degree. Go <laughs> <laughs> yes, she earned her medical degree at SUNY Upstate Medical University, uh, and here in Syracuse, New York, she's a board certified. She's board certified in internal medicine geriatric medicine and hospice and palliative medicine. Dr. Brangman is a SUNY Distinguished Service Professor and was recently named the inaugural chair of the Department of Geriatrics at SUNY Upstate Medical University. In addition to this, she's the director of the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease and director of Nappy Longevity Institute at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Dr. Brangman will speak about COVID-19 and give us some more about this Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and we also welcome you, Dr. Sharon Brangman, uh, to the town hall. Good to see you again. Thank you, George. And thank you to 100 Black men for inviting me. I'm in geriatrics, which means I take care of old people. But this is a virus that has been affecting everyone. And I wanted to speak specifically today about the vaccine. I've had patients who said, no, Dr. Brangman, no one's injected me with nothing like that. And I have friends who have told me that. And I just wanted to make sure that people get information that's based on facts and not fears and not off of something they got from Google or Facebook, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And as Dr. Griggs just told you, this virus has had a, a big impact in African-Americans we are two times as likely to die from it than white Americans are. One and a half times more for Latinos and for Native Americans. So this is no joke. And as you probably know, there's at least over 400,000 people who have already died. And it's expected that a half a million will die by the end of February. This virus is multiplying like wildfire. It's in every single nook and cranny in our country and the world. That's why they call it a pandemic because it's everywhere. I just read in the New York Times today that the last county in Hawaii finally got COVID. So it is everywhere. And it is so prevalent, everyone is gonna end up getting it. You've been lucky if you've been able to avoid it so far, but the concern is, is that you will not be able to avoid it eventually. And people who are getting positive now don't even know where they got it from because it's just everywhere. So I wanted to talk about this infection and we always talk about it in terms of people dying 
because we know that there's a high chance of dying if you're over the age of 60, if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you've had lung disease, if you have cancer, if you're pregnant, you're very vulnerable, if you're overweight, and that's because your lungs have to do more work when you have a lot of uh, body fat and, the, and this virus affects the lungs among other organs. And so you may have more trouble breathing. So if you get it, you have a high chance of dying if you're African-American. But death is not the only outcome here because there are some people who once they recover from COVID have what's called long haul symptoms. They have brain fog, their brain doesn't work so well. They may have a racing pulse because it affects your heart. The heart will start to speed up. There are some people who remain short of breath. They can't even walk you know, from the bathroom to their bed without getting short of breath. They have problems maintaining good blood pressure. When they stand up, they feel like they're gonna pass out. So we shouldn't just think of death as an outcome there are people who have chronic illness. And there was an article I read that said they looked at a chest X-ray of somebody who had a very mild case of COVID and their chest X-ray looked worse than somebody who had been smoking for many years. So there is a concern that even for people who have mild COVID, we are gonna be seeing lung diseases that are gonna span the next decades. So you can die but you can also end up living with very bad remnants of this uh, disease. And right now there is no treatment. There are things that we have learned over this past 10 to 12 months on how to take care of people in the hospital, but there's nothing that we can give you that will say, take this, call me in the morning, you will be better. So the best way to handle this right now is to prevent it from happening. And the, their ways to prevent it are what we've all been hearing, wearing a mask, and now we should probably we be wearing double masks, stay, you know, keep some distance between people and, and wash your hands. Now there is a variation of the COVID now that comes, one comes from South Africa, one comes from England, and these are even more contagious. There's some information now that the one, especially from UK may be more deadly. Right now, it looks like they're still covered by the vaccines we have available, but the more a virus has a chance to spread, every time it multiplies and spreads to someone else, it always changes form. So at some point we may run into trouble with a, a virus that doesn't respond to the vaccine, but right now it does. Um, you've heard of some people saying they lose their sense of taste and smell as some of the hints that they may be getting sick. There's a lot of different ways this creeps up on people, a sore throat, maybe feeling tired, and it can vary from person to person. Uh, but right now there is nothing that we can take to make it go away. So you want to try to uh, prevent it. Now, a lot of people have been very suspicious and cautious about this vaccine. And part of it is because it came from a White House where we had no trust. And I can tell you, I was very skeptical when I heard the former president talking about the vaccine because he was someone who had no respect for science or respect for anyone unless they were his buddy. And unfortunately, the vaccine was made under um, a program called Operation Warp Speed. And in medicine, anything that's made fast makes me nervous because we usually take a lot of time to figure things out and test it. So calling it Warp Speed and coming from the former president made me very skeptical. But then I had a chance to read about it, talk to colleagues, and I started to understand that even though this vaccine was made quickly, it wasn't rushed. It's based on a format, a special kind of vaccine process that's almost 30 years old. And it's now being looked at for treating cancers and other things because it uses our own immune system to protect us. And as um, Dr. Griggs mentioned, it takes a little bit of protein from the spike 
of the virus. And if you've seen a picture of that virus, it's a little circle with these little spikes coming out, kind of looks like Bantu braids kind of sticking out all over. They take a little piece of that spike. So that means it's not the whole virus. So it's not gonna make you get sick. It's not gonna give you the virus because it's not the whole virus. They take a little piece of it. They put it in a bubble of fat so that it can stick to your cells better. And then when your body sees that, it says, this is a foreign object. I'm going to make some cells to protect you. So when you get the first shot, it starts that process. And then a few weeks later, when you get the second shot, it finishes the process. So the, as you know, right now, there are two vaccines available. Um, there sh should be a third one shortly. But these two vaccines are similar because they're called mRNA vaccines. And that gets a little technical, I won't get into it, but it's very effective. By the, after you get the second shot, you have 95% protection. Not 100%, but very close. And it's safe. One of the things I found out is that when they started these trials, they started giving people samples of this vaccine back in July, you usually find out if there's a side effect within the first six to eight weeks of getting the vaccine. And so they gave people this vaccine and in six to eight weeks, there were minimal side effects. So we know it's safe and we know it's effective. I just got my second and final shot last week. And after the first one, my arm was sore, just like it is when I get the flu shot or any other shot. If you get the Pfizer vaccine, you have to get your second shot 21 days later. If you get the Moderna vaccine, you have to get your second shot 28 days later. If you start off with the Pfizer, your second shot would be should be with the Pfizer. You shouldn't mix or match. And they're both about the same. There's no big difference between the Pfizer or the Moderna. So whichever one you can get, you should just get it. So we know that it's effective. We know that it's safe. And people say, well, you don't know what they're putting in that thing. I heard that they were putting little sensors so they could monitor you. Somebody said they saw on Facebook that Bill Gates was putting little uh, transmitters into the vaccine so that they can track you. And that's beyond ridiculous. I don't even know where some of these things come from. And that is not a good reason to stay away from the vaccine. I heard someone else say, well, I heard they were gonna target African-Americans and anytime they target us, that's not a good thing. So target was probably not a good word to use, but it does not mean that you are being singled out to get something bad. We know that this virus has a high rate of killing you or leaving you with some serious disease and the vaccine is effective 95% protection and it's safe. Um, the side effects are, mi are minor. And unfortunately, we will still have to wear a mask and be careful after the vaccine until enough of the country and the world also gets the vaccine because the vaccine will still be in circulation and it will still be available. What we need is to have about 75 to maybe even 80 or higher percent of everyone in the country getting the vaccine so that we could start to resume normal life. Life will never be like it was last year. We'll have a new normal. But what we want is that for so many people to have the vaccine that the virus has nowhere to land. The virus is circulating around, but if everyone is protected, it has nowhere to settle in. And that's similar to say smallpox. When I was younger, I had a smallpox vaccine. Smallpox is essentially wiped off the face of the earth because so many people got vaccinated, it has nowhere to settle right now. Similar to polio. Um, I was in school, I had to go take polio on a little sugar cube. So many people got a vaccine to polio that even though that virus is still around, it can't settle in because everyone's protected. So this virus is probably with us to stay, but we just don't want it to settle in our bodies. And the best way to protect ourselves right now, 
uh, while you're waiting for a chance for a vaccine, is to wear a mask, be careful around people, wash your hands, and when a vaccine is available, you should give serious consideration to getting it. Oh. Um, I think that's the basics of it. it. It's effective in all age groups. Um, it, were, it hasn't been tested in people who are 18 or younger. And right now, there are some studies to start to look at it in children. It wasn't tested in pregnant people, uh, but I do know some nurses and doctors who are pregnant who did get the vaccine. So if you're pregnant, you should probably talk to your obstetrician to see what makes sense. Uh, hopefully we're gonna have more information about younger people soon and pregnant women, um, but those are the basics about the vaccine. Dr. Brangman, uh, you talked about the second dose and a couple of questions around the timeline. You know, we're hearing in New York that there's significant delays, you know, there's no guarantee as to when in, anyone can be vaccinated. But if you had the first dosage and now there's delays for the second dosage, uh, what what happens in that in that time frame if you can't get the second doses within the 21 or the 28 days? So that's going to be a concern. You should try to get it as soon as possible. But what what you do is you want it to be within that window because that's when it was tested to be the most effective. So if you can't get it in that window, do you have to start the whole process all over again? No, right now we don't have information about having to start all over again. The information that I have is you want to get that second vaccine as soon as you can. Well, and yeah, then, and you then, want to, right? I but know. if it's not available, then what do you do? So you get it as soon as you can, and then we're Steve. gonna have to get more information. I'm hopeful that with a new administration, we're gonna get things organized. Um, you know, there, there was no plan before. And yeah, now that, there yeah. is a plan, but it does take a little while to get that plan going. Now, from what I understand, they have not been giving out the first vaccine to people unless they were sure they were gonna get the second one. Within the so, time frame. So they do have plans. They don't wanna extend themselves so that they're giving so many first shots that they don't have the second one. What so, struck me, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, thank you, Dr. Bangman. What also struck me about what you said, uh, which was actually startling and alarming, which was that everyone is gonna get it and it's everywhere because people don't even know how they're getting it. And that that was startling to me because, which, which then bodes for the making sure that you're doing the adequate protection with the double masking. I started that this week. I heard that the other day, I started to do it. Um, but people are still traveling. They're going on, you know, people are going on vacation. They're doing all kinds of things. And I'm trying to figure out, is there, uh, I'm just trying to figure out how that's possible. It's a mistake. When... It's a mistake. Okay. So people yeah. are tired of the virus, but the virus is not tired of us. And okay. I can understand being fatigued. I am too, but the virus is out there and it's waiting to catch you. And the mm. thing is, is that most people don't have any symptoms. They look fine. So yeah. right now, people are saying, oh, she looks OK. I'm going to invite her over to dinner. I'm going to go out for drinks. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to I'm going to Disneyland. I mean, things that are not essential so that the virus right now is being transmitted between people who look like they're not sick. Obviously, if mm. someone's coughing, you're not going to hang out with them, right? right. But people who do not look sick and you're gathering in little small groups, next thing you know, they all have the virus. So I have some patients who are grandparents whose adult grandchildren came to visit them for Christmas. They haven't seen them all year. They were missing them. Their grandchildren are very careful. Everybody looked fine. And guess what? The grandparents all tested positive after Christmas. So if you think you can tell who has that virus just by looking at them, you should patent it and become a millionaire. What about, one more quick thing, and then we do have questions uh, loading up in the Q&A. By the way, get your questions in and we'll get them answered. I'm trying to put all of this, I'm going to do like three questions in one. What about the anti-vaxxers? We all know that there are some people who had adverse reactions to the vaccine and 
this idea about why it is that black folk are dying more when they get it. And you know, I lost my mom to, to COVID. So I, I, I'm, I'm uh, yes, yeah, it's just, uh, straight up. I understand what that feels like. So uh, tell me, can you answer all that? The anti-vaxxers and yeah. So first of all, black people getting it is not because we have a biological or a genetic deficit. Black people are getting it because most of us don't have jobs where we can work from home. We have to go work with people. We may not have a private car. We may take the bus to work. So therefore you are in public transportation and you're around people. And then you're more likely to have a job where you are in contact with people all day, whether it's working in a nursing home or in a grocery store or whatever you're doing. You may not be living in a big, you know, 10 bedroom house with two or three acres. You may be living with a lot of people in your house. You may not be able to control how they come and go. So we as African-Americans tend to have jobs that are on the front line. We tend to have to take public transportation to get there. And we tend to not have as much control about our living environment. So therefore we have been exposed to the virus more than others. It's not because we are black and there's a deficit in the black gene. I think that's totally right. a bogus. Anti-vaxxers, unfortunately, uh, they're kind of like QAnon. It's very hard to talk to them. And that, that's one of the reasons why measles has started to appear again. Um, mm -hmm. uh, diseases that we had essentially wiped out. So I'm not sure how we're going to talk to um, anti-vaxxers. It's very similar to the people who don't want to wear a mask and feel like it's a personal affront to their freedom to wear a mask. I can uh, tell you that when I see the virus in 18 or 25 year olds who are going out to a restaurant, I just wait a couple of weeks and then my older patients start to get sick and die. So yeah, there's one yeah, thing wow. that virus has shown us is that we are all connected and that virus circulates. So my patients who are homebound and don't go anywhere, maybe they have a home health aide coming in to help them or somebody dropping off groceries. When I see the virus spike in the community with all the people who are going out for drinks and you know living their lives, that ends up killing someone's grandmother. So mm. that is the connection. Are, are you telling are you telling me not to go to dinner with somebody out in the public? I would not eat in a restaurant right now. Absolutely not. I would really? not eat indoors because number one, you have to take off your mask to eat. So therefore you're exposed. And number two, most restaurants don't have a good ventilation system. So that virus is all over. You're sitting in a cloud of a virus and everybody looks healthy, but somebody in there is sick. And you mm. can guarantee that if you go to a restaurant, there's at least a couple of people who are sick. They're laughing. I don't know if you've ever seen some of those ultraviolet- um, uh, Things when they, with, right, with the, yeah, 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 yeah. All you have to do is laugh and you are essentially bathing your next person in saliva. It's gross. So what's the difference? And then, and, and I don't know if Dr. Gritz, I saw you, either you were giving her the thumbs up on that one or you would, is that what you were doing? Uh, no, no, I was going, referring to the ventilation system, the uh, yeah. in, indoor ventilation. Uh, we did say that there's an airborne component to it. Uh, it has to do with the size of the droplets, the micro droplets can get caught up in the system. If you need to do anything oh. you're gonna do outside to get caught up on the air currents. There were studies out of Cuba, there was, I mean, out of, out of Korea, uh, and there were studies uh, early on that showed that there was one person sitting at a table here and infected 12 people that exactly. were sitting at the tables next to them early on. Mm. And it was from one person was 12 people. And this was early on dining in a restaurant. Yeah. All right. So what about I go to Wegmans, I go to Piggly Wiggly or whatever the stores are. And what's the difference between going to Wegmans and, or going to a restaurant? Well, you're taking a risk when you go to anywhere indoors. That's why people are getting um, online groceries or curbside pickup. I was in Wegmans and I saw someone take off their mask to sneeze, Ooh. which totally defeats the purpose. And then I'm like, why am I here? Mm. So I wear mm. two masks, I wear a face shield, but this new contagious, super contagious one, 
Um, I, th I think people should be doubling up on their masks. They should be wearing a face shield and they should try to stay out of big gatherings as much as possible because that's yeah. where you get the risk. To, to, to Dr. Yeah. Brangman's point, it's not just one. Uh, there are, are three that we're looking at. There's actually six or seven that we're looking at right now, but there's one that they're talking about, the one from the UK, the B117. Then there's one from South Africa. Then there's one from Brazil. The ones from South Africa and Brazil, we thought were actually more lethal and more dangerous than the one from the UK. But now we're finding out it's equally as, as, as dangerous with a higher lethality, meaning that can, can, can kill you more and 50 to 70% more infectious. 50 to 70% more infectious. And that's all three of them. And then we're worried about other components of it where they decrease our body's antibody response and potentially increase the viral load, meaning that they have more soldiers to, to attack us than we have to protect ourselves. And all of them are more infectious than the current version. So there's a, there's a reason, and I'm not gaslighting, but there's a reason to take this thing more seriously. Every reason that you think that you should be able to go outside, there's 10 reasons that you need to stay in. And there's 10 grandparents or parents that can tell you that you need to stay inside. And, 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 and not have people over either uh, in your house unless no. they're in your immediate no. family. So that's the other thing. People say, oh, I know they're very careful. They're as careful as we are. And they have them over for dinner. And then somebody turns positive. All right, I got a couple of questions here. One is about people who have asthma. Should they take the vaccine? So yes, asthma is a lung condition. Any condition that already affects your heart and your lungs makes you have a bad outcome. So yes. Um, so I go to the gym and and so indoor, talk to me about indoor, the gym. Indoor gym. I go, I go, I'm going, I, I, you should not. stop, stop indoor it. Gym. Indoor gym, that's like an indoor restaurant. If your if your trainer wants to take you outside, in the cold the snow, we, we're not we're not in New Orleans, Doctor Brangman. It's cold up here. Yeah, so it's not worth it, George. Let me argue for my gym. So let me just argue for my gym. There's only like three people in it at a time. So what? And so what? Okay, you're not you're not trying to hear that. Stay out the gym. No, stay out the gym. Stay out the gym. You said it's cold in New York. Yeah, that means that you have, have the heat on in the gym. There's some type of ventilation. There are no windows mm -hmm. open. One person being sick, asymptomatic, can have a viral load through the roof and feel fine. They breathe it out. You get close. You breathe in enough of it, you're sick. And when everybody's mm. in the gym, they're breathing hard. So they're really exhaling droplets. Mm. And if you had an ultraviolet light, you would see you are walking through a sea of droplets. There are, there are, so there, over the course of this thing, we've shown studies where they've done those studies and they've shown people, there's this thing called a slipstream. Even when you're jogging outside, if you're jogging and you breathe yeah. out, it goes back for 33 feet. Yeah. 33 feet. You're jogging. So there's some concern that six feet is still not far enough away, but you know, there's like a reasonable amount of space. So there was another article I read that people who wore contacts or didn't wear glasses had a higher rate of getting COVID. Because mm. there are ACE2 receptors in the eyes as so well. The, the mucous membranes in the eyes, especially now with this super contagious variety, may mm -hmm. cling more to mucous membranes or the soft tissue that's in your eyes. So wearing glasses is a good first step but you should probably have a face shield that comes down over your face. Mm -hmm. Plus that, two masks in addition, and double mask. And double mask. And, and she right. talks about the more infectious version. What happens is that red spike that you see, believe it or not, it's nature evolving. There's a 20, to 20 degree rotation that it does. And as opposed to it attaching to the receptor, like a heel, there's a toe receptor. So it's a dual, it, it attaches in two spots to the actual receptor. And this is from Dr. Tulio out of South Africa that there was a four hour lecture and it's just the virus. It's amazing to watch the virus do what it does, but it's coming for us and we need to protect ourselves at all costs. There's no argument. The virus won't argue back. It will agree with you. Yeah, come on, go to the gym. Let's go eat. I, I, you go to the gym, you go out to eat. You're rude. You're, every time you do, your odds are just getting narrower and narrower for you to get sick. So yep. you should not do it, George. I know you're uh. working out, you lost weight, that's great. You don't want to lose weight by fitting into a casket either. Oh No, I don't. Ooh, no, you didn't either. Did she just come for me? I sure, she Ooh, sure did. She did. Listen, 
come on with your questions in the Q and A because uh, we've got two uh, physicians here, Dr. Eric Griggs, and Dr. Sharon Brangman, talking about COVID, talking about the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Brangman has had the vaccine and is recommending it. Uh, you had said something about. Uh, did you also, Dr. Griggs? I did. I get my second dose next week. And one of the things you talked about, Dr. Brangman, was the um, these variants. Now, Moderna says that their vaccine should help with the variant, but that they're working on something to help with that. And I'm not sure what Pfizer is saying. So with these new strains, uh, can you just, can you give us something about that? Well, uh, I think they planned it because they know that viruses do change over time. The mm -hmm. virus's job is to figure out how to infect you. And when your body starts to put up resistance, it changes its shape. So right now, these two viruses are doing the job. I mean, these two vaccines are doing the job. Now, there may be a time when they're going to have to adjust the vaccines to be able to cover the new strain. Just like every year when we get a flu shot, they give you a different combination in that flu shot to try to hit that flu that's going to be around for the year because the flu changes also. So what right, about now, taking, oh. right now, I would say take Moderna, take Pfizer. If another vaccine becomes available, take it because that's the best thing we have right now. And if we need something later, then we'll figure it out. So Dr. Brangman, to your point, Moderna is actually, they started a clinical trial. They've acknowledged that this new vaccine, and the reason why is because the mutations are taking place in different spots. They've acknowledged that they're, they're working on a booster, another booster to cover these other variants. We do have some level of protection from Pfizer. They said that two weeks ago. And now Moderna came out and said the same thing. But they also, in addition, said, because everyone is concerned with this more aggressive aggressive variant that they're working on the booster to cover that as well. The, the good news, the good news is outside of the fact that, that Dr. Kazmikia Corbett, which is an African-American woman, helped develop the virus. It's always good to know. And Onis, Onisius came up with the first, uh, an African-American came up with the first vaccine. The good news is that because of this messenger RNA um, technology, it doesn't take that long. All they, they took the genetic code for the spikes they took it in, messenger RNA is like, I, I tell people it's like myself when I was a little kid, my grandmother wanted to know, relay a message to my granddaddy, what your daddy want to eat? He said he want pork rolls, green beans, and mashed potatoes. I run in and I, ask, I give it to her and she makes it. The messenger RNA code takes the code for the spike, puts it into the this thing called the ribosome and makes your own muscle cells uh, spike factories. So you start manufacturing, not even the virus, just the spikes, and your body creates a response to it. So all we need is the code of the changes, and we can come up with boosters and help protect ourselves. So it's good news. It's good news. What about, uh, so the question about, is takeout food a risk as well? No, takeout no. is not the same because you're picking it up, hopefully, at the curb or <laughs> some contact delivery. Right. Some way we're not delivery. going indoors. So that's an option. Um, and remember, the okay. primary mode of, tr of transmission is respiratory. It's not what's called fomites. The, mm -hmm. or, or the so there was some, there is some concern about how long the virus can live on a surface. Right. And that's mm -hmm. why you want to wash your hands frequently. But the most right. common way to get this is through the air. Yeah. So you can now, pick up food, and wash your hands, and eat it. And, and we're, we are going to the barbers in New York, so that's still okay because they. I would not go to a barber. Oh, no. you, I know I, I'm, I'm I going, have, but <laughs> I would go but on YouTube true. and figure out how to cut my hair. I know that's right. Go to a barber. There are usually a lot of people sitting around waiting their turn. It's indoors, and you got to take off your mask so they can get all around your edge up, right? So well, it, that yeah, 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 yeah. George, that's dangerous. I know. I'm, I'm going to say that my barber does a hundred percent with the whole only one person so in. Go into the gym. You go into a restaurant. You go oh, into a barber shop. No, I, yeah, I, I'm I doing all the bad stuff. I, but but I, I'm speaking for everybody else. All right, I got, I got you. I got you. Uh, I'm going to go back to a question earlier, Dr. Griggs, about the concern about belly fat for males and females. 
So the, the concern about belly fat, even prior to COVID, is this thing called intra-abdominal fat or visceral fat. It's definitely linked. It's been, the, the studies have shown it's linked to every chronic disease and every bad thing that we can possibly, you could, it, it's metabolized differently. It increases your rate, uh, your risk of diabetes. It increases your risk of cancer. It increases your risk of, of hypertension or, or stroke. So it's this visceral intra-abdominal fat, uh, the quote unquote dad bod fat uh, that is, is concerning. Um, mm -hmm. It decreases, and Dr. Brangman talked about it earlier. Uh, it can decrease the your your the the space for you to breathe. It can decrease mm -hmm. your lung capacity. And if you want to relate it to COVID nineteen, anything that decreases your ability to breathe or oxygenate increases your risk for COVID nineteen. And the intra abdominal fat, by in and of itself, um, can increase uh, can shorten your life. I have some rapid fire questions, so if you could just get right to yeah. the point, that'd be great. If uh, will the flu sh if I can't get the vaccine, will the flu, flu shot do? I could almost answer no, that. I'm not a medical no. professional. You Thank still you. Get a flu <laughs> shot. You should still get a flu shot, but it's two different viruses, two different if problems. I, um, you said this was sort of answered, but let's get clarity here. If I stay six feet away while visiting outside, is a mask still necessary? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, six feet how, is a minimum. It's a minimum. Yeah. minimum. That, that's the part we left out this whole thing. It's a minimum of six feet. The first, right. If somebody was sick and had boils and green stuff coming out of their eyes, you would stay more than six feet. Pretend people are sick and it's contagious. It, it's right. the truth. You have to assume everybody has it. How long can the virus live on the surface? Maybe 24 hours. It depends on the surface. Yeah, I've heard up anywhere from 24. I've heard up to 72, but you got to realize those are... Those are in lab conditions, but wipe the stuff off and wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. All right, this is a question about uh, what, the Johnson & Johnson has not come out with theirs yet, but what can you say about that? Because they're saying that they only, their vaccine is gonna be a one dose uh, version of it. So what can you say about that? So it's that's a, gonna, gonna, uh, that, go ahead, go ahead. that should get approved. We should be hearing about that very soon. We do not know yet how effective it's going to be, but it is a one shot deal. So that means it's much easier to get. And I imagine it's going to, and it doesn't need to be kept super cold like the Pfizer um, vaccine does. So that means it's going to be very good for lots of countries in the world and people who live in rural areas that's hard to get, hard to come back and forth and get two shots. But we don't have enough information yet to know if it's effective what its effective rate is. Yeah, and it, it, it will be a different mechanism of action, but we'll get to that when we get to it, if we get to it, because at any given point, we could say, nah, we're gonna do something else. Now, Dr. Griggs, not to create any controversy here, but are you as like draconian as Dr. Dr. Uh, Brangman around, don't go, to the, don't go to the store, don't get your hair cut, don't go to the gym, don't go to the barber. You, so, you said, I, am, I, am I not? No, I, I absolutely agree with everything uh, that she's saying, because let me tell you, the problem is Dr. Fauci said it this weekend. He said it again today. We don't get too complacent. This variant and the, what's coming is bad. It's horrible. It really is. Mm. We're going to have potentially two, three different circulating uh, viruses that are at least one to potentially one and a half to two times worse than what we're seeing now. The moment we let our guard down, the virus is going to jump in. You look, you learn to shave your head at your home. You, walk, you can walk around <laughs> your house, exercise. <laughs> But but I'm glad you just, I mean, you're basically saying be over extra. You can't be too careful. You can't wear your mask enough. You can't, you can't protect yourself. Oh, I want, I know the one thing I wanted to ask. There, there was all, you said the double masking, but there was also something about if you're wearing the cloth mask that you should also wear the surgical mask double mask. to yeah. Dub, yeah. double mask. And can you just quickly, we have about a minute. One of you tell me about the different, there's the KN95, the N95, which one, because my daughter was just asking me. Um, N95 is very hard to get because those are mostly for healthcare workers. They right. call it 95 because it filters out 95% of particles. But you can make your own N95 equivalent by wearing, say, a surgical mask yeah. and then yeah. a three-layer cotton mask on top of it. So, so you yeah, because I know. yeah. So, so the, the KN95 was just a version that was approved because there was a shortage in supply. 
It is, I think it, it's a Chinese, the, from a China. It was a Chinese version of the N95 masks that were used to supplement when we did not have enough N95s. And understand this about N95s, when we wear those in the hospital, they're fitted. You have to go through a whole test. They right, right. The sugar and all that stuff. And so the thing if is, I don't, people don't wear them correctly. So I see the nose sticking nose. out. I and, see them pointed and, under I, their I, chin. I, I see people have them on their chin around their ear. I'm like, what the hell is the purpose of that? And if, you have a beard, if you have a beard, it doesn't give you a tight seal. So I see people with facial hair where all these gaps on the side. The and it's the virus is just spewing right out. If you email me video, email me, uh, I can send you videos that show the, the difference. Do you know the one that's really bad is that mask that people wear with the hole? Oh yeah, it don't look at it, that. It defeats the purpose. That's a vent. That yeah. vent is letting everything out. The vent. So it makes that person feel more comfortable, but it's totally defeating the purpose. It's like the guy who took off the mask to sneeze. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes no yeah. sense. Yeah. Is George there? Uh-oh, I think George froze up. So well, we're that, it, out the it, show here. Yeah, it, it's been a pleasure meeting you. Hopefully folks, uh, when George, while George comes back on, uh, we've been helpful. Dr. Brangman, it was a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, nice to meet you, Dr. Griggs. On the air, it sounds like we're soldiers in the same fight, speaking the same language. All right. Uh, folks, the, to the 100 black men of Syracuse, we really, really thank you for having us here. Uh, Doc, you want to give them give them something to go home with? So I guess my take home message is don't let your guard down because we're very close to having a vaccine that will be helpful. And remember that the person who looks totally healthy is probably uh, infected. You have to assume that everybody has the virus and act accordingly. All right, that'll do it. I'd like to thank Dr. Griggs and Dr. Brangman for all of you who have joined us for this informative and necessary town hall. Our next town hall will be the fourth Monday, February 22nd from 5.30 to 6.30 with the topic brain and mental health. And one of our presenters will be Dr. Sharon Brangman. Uh, please fill out the post event survey as soon as we end this event because we really need your response to our presentations. Again, thank you to Dr. Eric Griggs, Dr. Sharon Brangman. And again, join us on Monday, February 22nd from 5.30 to 6.30. And then thank you once again for joining us on town hall number two. And again, we want to know how we did. Please, please complete the one minute online survey about this evening's program, your participation in our town hall series and your answers to the online survey are greatly appreciated. And on behalf of the 100 black men of Syracuse, I'm George Kilpatrick, Power 620 Inspiration for the Nation every Sunday morning at nine. We thank you for joining us, Power Pack panel. And when this um, is over on Facebook Live, y'all need to share this with every single person that you know, because they drop some knowledge, some pearls and some wisdom. Have a great night.